Let us open our Bibles this morning. Thank you. Thank you to this uh, worship team that has brought us the word in song this morning. And we're, we're now going to read it in our word and meditate on it, reflect on the preaching of his word. And I invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians 5. We continue on with a few more verses in this chapter. As we continue in the series, The Spirit-Filled Life, Holiness, Ambition. We have subtitled the message for today, The Fellowship of the Saints. The Fellowship of the Saints. The passage that we're going to read doesn't specifically talk about or mention the word fellowship. However, we're going to see in the passage aspects of our fellowship. And in seeing aspects of our fellowship in this passage, the essence of what our fellowship is can be highlighted. So that's what our task is this morning. I'd like to highlight for you this morning with the help of God what the essence of fellowship is by looking at some aspects, important aspects of the saints' fellowship. So let us us read Ephesians 5. We're going to begin in verse 18, pick it up in that verse, and then on through 21. And it reads, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we open up the Scriptures. And Father, we know that You convey Your presence to us through Your Word. So Father, here we are desiring to commune with You as You speak Your Word to us by Your Spirit and by this sermon. Lord, Who is sufficient for this task? No one. So, Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me, to make me a fit vessel, and to now give me understanding. Give me, Father, help me, allow me to move in the gift of teaching and prophecy so that I may speak to your people. I need you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. By way of introduction... I'd like to ask you a couple of questions that may highlight this topic of fellowship, especially fellowship of the saints. And I ask you this morning, how many of us have experienced the need, the longing to belong somewhere? Isn't that right? That we all experience that need. We want to belong somewhere. But at the same time, how many have found it difficult to do so? You have found it a struggle. You have found that there are so many obstacles to men's fellowship, especially fellowship in church. What are the joys and challenges of belonging and connecting with others? You've thought about that? What has been our experience in trying to connect and belong in church? I could... Uh, put before you a sample of statements and attitudes that sometimes we hear, such as, for example, there are many hypocrites in church, so why bother going? Um, Other times we hear, well, they're not paying attention to me, so um, these people are so mean, they don't care about my needs. Um, They don't want to do things my way, so I just go somewhere else and so on, so forth, and so on. People that just, you know, get offended very quickly and uh, take offense at the drop of a, of a hat. 
So many are sometimes the negative attitudes and the experiences that we have had in church trying to belong and trying to connect with others. But I ask you this morning, what attitudes and behaviors does the spirit-filled life manifest about church fellowship and service? When the spirit fills the life of a believer, what will be the attitudes? What will be the actions, the behaviors that will characterize that saying in fellowship and in service? The main idea for today's passage is that for those uh, children that are taking notes in their bulletin, you already heard the subtitle. You were supposed to fill in the blanks with the subtitle. The subtitle is The Fellowship of the Saints. And now we're going to read the main idea of this passage that I want to bring before you. And that is that the Spirit-filled life desires and strives for mutual fellowship, service, and edification. When we are spirit-filled, we desire and we strive for mutual fellowship. Can do without it. Mutual works of service. And we seek to edify others and to be edified by others in the body of Christ. All of that happens in the body of Christ. And we're going to see how the passage that we have read highlights the essence of what this fellowship is about. Okay? For example, if we go to verse, uh, verse 19, verse 19, the latter part of verse 19 says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And I want to highlight that phrase, in your heart, to begin this morning. It talks about song. It talks about what we have just done in singing, in singing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. But then it goes on to say, you do that, but you do it in your heart. It doesn't mean that it's not vocal, that it's not articulated, but there's something to be said here for the fellowship of the saints, that whatever we do in the fellowship of the saints ought to be a heart thing. Fellowship, number one, is a heart thing. Fellowship is not just about externals. It's not just about going through the motions of what we do in the Baptist church or at Tamiami or that church does this, this, and that. Those things may be important, have a place, but the fellowship of the saints, first and foremost, is a hard thing. That's why the Apostle Paul says, making melody in your heart. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. In your heart to the Lord. Fellowship can only happen when we have in our hearts a disposition of peace and communion. If your heart is not at peace, if your heart has not been put at rest, and if your heart has not been put in a disposition of communing with others, fellowship means sharing. God has called us to share with others. And He is going to give us a heart of sharing. We don't have that when we are rebels away from God. Oh, yes, we want to belong. Yes, we want to connect. And we talk about sharing, but the heart that is not reconciled with God is at heart selfish and self-centered. It's seeking their own way. So what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives is that He has given us a new nature, and in that new nature, He has set our hearts at peace, and He has given in our hearts now a disposition that comes from the Spirit that we now want to commune. We seek communion. We seek sharing with others. We are at peace. We are now at rest deep down in my heart in such a way that I can truly come and share and commune with others. So I want to tell you this morning that any issues with fellowship that you may be experiencing, any coldness, any indifference about fellowship, anything that is hindering your fellowship with the saints, 
It's first and foremost an issue of the heart. I don't want you to look outside first and say, oh, it's the pastor's problem, or it's such and such brother or sister's problem, or is the director's problem. No. Any issues and problems of fellowship is first and foremost a problem of the heart, and it begins with your heart. So we tell you this morning, mend your heart to mend your fellowship. You want your fellowship to be mended? You want to experience the joy of fellowship with others? Then you must go before God and put your heart before him and say, mend this broken heart. Mend this heart at war. Mend this heart that is at radically selfish and self-centered in the flesh. But Father, from your spirit, give me peace, give me rest, and give me a communing, sharing heart. That's where it starts. Let me show you how the Apostle Paul puts it in some supporting scriptures. If I may take you to see this in practice, let me take you to 2 Corinthians if there was a church that the Apostle Paul had more, more problems with and most conflict in, it was the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was one that rejected the Apostle Paul's leadership, underestimated him, did not consider him an apostle, had uh, rebelled against his leadership for a while. Consider the Apostle Paul no one that had many gifts as others, so had him in less of, of an esteem. And the Apostle Paul tells him in 2 Corinthians 1, now what would you do with a church like that, right? Or not just talk, going at it from the perspective of a pastor, now from the perspective of a member, a church member, what do you do in a church where you find conflicts and strifes and jealousies like we see in the church of Corinth? What do you do? Let me show you what Paul does. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 11 and 12. It says, Oh, Corinthians. The Apostle Paul says, Oh, Corinthians. There's a lot to be said for that all. <laughs> Have you ever had to say that for somebody? Oh, my daughter. <laughs> right? Oh, my child. Oh, my husband. It expresses somehow a longing at the same time that it expresses a grief, right? And the Apostle Paul says, Oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. Notice what Paul says to them. See, usually what fallen men or what our flesh wants to do when somehow we are contradicted or offended or crossed in any way, what we tend to do immediately is to do, close my heart. Hide my heart. Right? Put it away. You're not going to hurt me anymore. Uh-uh, I'm not going to keep going at you. I'm not going to keep pursuing fellowship. I'm just going to hide. I'm going to run away. Right? Well, that's not what the Apostle Paul does. On the contrary, the Apostle Paul bears his heart some more. It says, oh, Corinthians, here's my grief for you. Here's, here's my longing for you. Corinthians, our heart is wide open. We're ready to receive you. We're ready to have fellowship with you. Our hearts are mended. Our hearts are in the right place. But what about yours? Because fellowship is an issue of the heart. Verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, you're not restricted by us but you are restricted by your own affections. You see that? What is the Apostle Paul saying? Oh, the Apostle Paul understands that the enemy loves to play with people's affections. Look what they did to you. Yeah, yeah, just don't love them anymore. Just don't, don't be kind to them anymore. Don't even greet them anymore. Turn, turn your face. Just go the other way. Don't even fellowship with them. Restrict your heart. Let your heart shrink about fellowship. Hide your heart. Harden your heart. They don't deserve your affections. They don't deserve your longing for them. Isn't how many of us have experienced that? I know I can get amens today here left and right because that's what we have experienced. And that's where we go. 
But the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit challenges us about our fellowship with the saints. And the Apostle Paul says, it's not our heart that's restricting your fellowship with me. It's not the I want you to know that it's not my heart that is keeping you away. I want you to know that it is not that I am so offended that I would not want to pursue more fellowship with you. I am here ready. I am here bearing the weight. I am here suffering and longing with you and for you. Please open up your hearts too, he tells them. Fellowship is a hard thing. Obviously, it's not just a hard thing in terms of affections. It involves affections. But if you keep on reading this passage, then the Apostle Paul highlights something important about fellowship. And he says, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Oh, that we will learn that lesson. Oh, that this would really... Uh, seep into our spirits and get this truth. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness and what accord has Christ with Belial or what part has a believer with an unbeliever and what agreement has the temple of God with idols for you are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people why is the apostle Paul telling them that because he knows that it is sin it is their sinful ways that is hindering fellowship he says our fellowship is going to be restored when the sin of your heart gets taken care of, when you lay it out before God, when you deal with it, when you ask God, mend my sinful heart so that I can be at peace with you in one heart, in one spirit, and then I can be at peace in the fellowship of believers. The Apostle Paul is teaching us that fellowship is a thing of the heart and it's a thing also of the spirit it's a thing of morality. It's a thing of the quality of life that God has called us to share in. If we are, he says, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're no longer a temple of idols. Before, before we came to Christ, yeah, we run with a crowd of idolaters. And we worshiped idols too. But now, if the Holy Spirit lives in us, God says, come out. Verse 17, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. How are you going to experience fellowship with God? By conversion, through regeneration, by the Holy Spirit that sanctifies you. That's how you experience fellowship with God. Nearness to God is likeness with God. How are you going to experience God close and near you when you bear the fruit of what God is doing in your life? It is the fruit of the Spirit that allows you to experience fellowship with God. Nearness is likeness. Oh, I don't feel near God. Well, there are times that we cannot go just on feelings and emotions. That's right. That's fine. But I want to tell you that more often than not, if, if we are right with God, and that doesn't mean perfect, we're all sinners, but if we are confessing our sins every day, if we are wrestling with that sin, if we are taking every fallen deed of the flesh before Him and grieving it and confessing it, and, and if we are acting in the longing and desire to obey the Lord and hearing His voice and getting convicted about it and moving quickly to obey Him, I tell you, you're going to feel near God. You're going to experience fellowship with God. And then you will be ready for fellowship with God's people, with God's saints. Obviously, that requires that we're all doing this together. That we're all seeking fellowship with Him together from the heart. That we are truly opening up our hearts before the Lord and asking for a disposition of rest and peace with Him so that we can now come and be at rest and peace with one another.
Paul goes on to say here in chapter 7, verses, uh, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. See? Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfected holiness in the fear, in the fear of God. Your sinfulness affects our fellowship. Did you know that? When we, want, when we remain in our sin, it affects fellowship and it breaks fellowship. It doesn't just break fellowship with God and communion with God. It also begins to break fellowship with one another. Because what we're after is perfecting what? It says here, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What we're after is saying, Lord, I want to grow in being like Christ. I want to perfect my path, my walk with you. And that's what church ought to be about. We're helping one another perfect holiness in the fear of God. We have that one mind, that one purpose. So when somebody has quit on that or somehow becomes indifferent to that purpose or now has become rebellious to that purpose, now there is a mutiny in the ranks. The ranks now are affected. And that's why we have church discipline. Church discipline is not to uh, just expel anybody just to get rid of somebody. Church discipline is to restore somebody to fellowship and to communion. That's what it's about. So be mindful of that. Today we're going to have the Lord's Supper. I want to tell you this. Today we're having the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is the epitome of, of, the, of our fellowship. It's where we come and we sit down and we say all our accounts are cleared with God. We have confessed our sin. We have confessed before Him our struggle and our wrestling. We have come and we are coming now in fellowship with my brothers and sisters in unity and purpose of mind. I ask you, don't break ranks. Don't break ranks. Pastor, how do I break ranks? When you stay in your sin, you're breaking rank. Yeah, I know that some honestly then say, I'm not going to take the Lord's Supper, but that doesn't fix it. That doesn't fix it. That doesn't fix the problem of fellowship because the problem of the heart remains there. Then you've come in and you've gone out and your heart remains unaffected. And what God wants you to do so that you can enjoy the blessedness of fellowship with Him and fellowship with one another is mend your heart. What is God asking you to do? What action is God telling you to do to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord? Do it. Don't, don't delay anymore. Today is the day that he's calling you to fellowship, to mend your heart before God. What is it? What is it? Ask God. You don't understand, Pastor. The situation is very complicated. I may not understand it fully, but God does. God does. There was once I was confronted with a situation like that. And I just laid down on my knees and I said, God, please, I can't deal with this. you got to help me here, Lord. Give me an answer. Help me break through this. The enemy is just sometimes going to tie you up into knots. And God is going to allow sometimes for you to be tied up into knots in your personal life. And that has come as a result of you breaking ranks. Breaking fellowship with God and breaking fellowship with brothers and sisters. He wants to undo those knots. He wants to now bring you back at peace, bring you back at rest. He wants again to cleanse your soul. He wants to put you at peace in your family, in your, with God's people and before God. Don't you long for that peace? Don't you long for that peace of the saints? You should if you're a child of God. You're going to desire and strive for mutual fellowship. And it is a hard thing. You have to mend your heart to mend your fellowship. Mend your heart, please. It's not just about staying out or sitting out. 
It's, you go, everywhere you go, I've had people say, oh, I've got to run away. I've got to go somewhere else where nobody knows me. And, and, where, and where, what are you going to do with your heart? That one goes with you wherever you go. How long are you going to escape and run? Another church, another pastor, another context. And what are you going to do with your heart? The Bible says, where will you run from God's presence? Where are you going to go? Wherever you go, his piercing, discerning, loving gaze is upon you. And as a father disciplines his children, and as he did this church of Corinth, because we know the end for this church of Corinth. We know with what great zeal they repented. We know with what great passion they turned back and received Titus and received Paul. And they were all restored. Why? Because there was a shepherd that did not give up on them. I was able to pursue them and say, my heart is open, I'm waiting on you. My heart is open. My heart is open. My heart's not restricted. My heart is open. That's number one. Number two, fellowship is a God thing. We have already hinted at that, obviously. It's a hard thing because fellowship is a God thing. We see that in verse 19. Go back to Ephesians Ephesians 5, 19, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Fellowship is a God thing. Fellowship in your heart to the Lord. Notice that even though we talk about fellowship being horizontal, and it is horizontal, one another, okay? True fellowship is motivated and empowered by an outward and upward movement of the soul. See, see, in the same way that you cannot fix your fellowship without fixing your heart, you cannot fix your fellowship by just going horizontally to, the other, to your other fellow brothers and sisters. You have to go to God first. So that's why it says here, make a melody in your heart. It's a thing of the heart to the Lord. It's a God thing. So it is motivated and empowered by an upward movement of the soul to God. Fellowship can only be sustained, listen to this, can only be sustained by those who continually look outside of themselves. If you get all caught up and wrapped up in yourself, man, you're going to be ready for offense, ready to rumble. Man, you're going to be just a, um, a hot element in, in fellowship. You're going to jump the gun at any moment. If you're, all, if you're all caught up in yourself, and that's what happens when people blow the fuse. That's what happens to people that are so, you, you, there's just too much of yourself in you, brother. You've got to die to yourself, man. It's just not about you. This is about what God is doing through you. This is about Christ and Him being exalted. Fellowship can only be sustained it is, it, otherwise it's not sustainable. By those who continue to look outside of themselves for the energies and power of fellowship, where? Namely, to God. Man, they've done it again, man. They, a guy again, he keeps looking at me the wrong way. Oh, God, but I'm going to look to you for it. I'm going to rest it in your, I'm going to rest it in, in your cross. They looked at you the wrong way. Man, they've offended me. Oh, God, I'm, I'm just going to lay down at your feet. You were offended beyond compare. No, they don't want to talk to me. They, they just left me alone. They don't want to. Oh, but they left you alone, Jesus. So I'm just, I'm just going to lay it at your feet, Lord. It's a God thing. You've got to look out first. You keep looking to you and to your big self, man. You know what? You're going to keep exploding. You're going to keep just not being able to really be in fellowship with the same. You're going to be hop you're going to keep hopping from church to church. You're going to keep seeking for that perfect place. You'll never find it. And then it's been said that if you find it, then you'll ruin it. <laughs> because you brought your imperfections into that place. So how can we make for fellowship? Number one, it's a hard thing. We'll look into our hearts and then we'll look outwardly to God. Fix fellowship by fixing on God. That's how you're going to fix your fellowship. Mend your heart to mend your fellowship. Fix fellowship by fixing on God. 
Notice what it says there in 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. Once again, the Apostle Paul in the midst of a conflict with brothers and sisters in a church. And notice what he says to this church. What he lives by in his own personal life. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 and 4. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. How do you know that you have truly been comforted by God? You're able to comfort others. How do you know that this has become a God thing in your life? You're being comforted by God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall raise my eyes to the hill. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. You're no longer just waiting to get your satisfaction from the brother, from the pastor, from so and so. Even though those things need to be fixed. But first and foremost... You're no longer trying to fix your fellowship just by looking horizontally, but you are paying attention to God and your eyes are fixing on God and you're receiving comfort from Him. Your heart is being made at peace from God. You're receiving rest from your communion with Him. And when you experience that, then you are ready to fellowship with others. It's from Him. That comfort is going to come. And comfort is coming so that you may fellowship. If you have been comforted, but you don't have the ability to comfort others, you have not been comforted by God. You may have taken a pill. You may have gone to a anger management class. Okay? But it hasn't been comfort from God. Because comfort from God puts you in fellowship. Comfort from God gives you a welcoming heart. Comfort from God enlarges your heart. It doesn't shrink it. It doesn't just turn it inward so that you don't care about anybody else. Comfort from God is meant to be shared. It's meant for fellowship. Notice what it says in James. Go now to James. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 19 and 20. James says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, swift to hear, quick to hear. That means you're paying attention to what somebody else is speaking. That means fellowship. You're sharing, you're hearing somebody else's mind. Slow to speak. Listen. Listen, slow to wrath means slow to anger. For the anger of man, the wrath of man, does not produce the righteousness of God. I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take care of that matter into my own hands. That doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Are you about perfecting fear and the holiness of God? Well, your anger ain't going to fix it. Your wrath is not going to fix it. Your short temper is not going to fix it. It's not going to fix it. You need to grieve that. You need to cry over that. And then notice what it says. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Receive. It's a hard thing. Receive with meekness the implanted word. Where does that word get implanted? In your heart. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. We're going to be talking about that. Receive it deep. Let that word go to work in the deepest recesses of your soul, bearing your sins before God. And then it's a double-edged sword, the Bible says. It penetrates, it discerns your thoughts, your intentions. It bears you, it turns you outside out before God so that you may see the grace of God for you and a God that wants to heal you and a God that wants to set you at peace, a God that wants to set you at rest. 
A God that wants you to grow in Him. A God that wants you to experience the consequences and the result of the implanted heart, which is the fruit of the Spirit, likeness with Christ, hence and nearness with God. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Fellowship is a God thing. And then we go back to Ephesians. And now more specifically, we see, and we're going to continue to see that next Sunday, in Ephesians uh, 5.20, B says, the whole verse, given thanks, always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fellowship is a hard thing. Fellowship is a God thing. Fellowship is a Christ thing. It's a Christ thing. It says, given thanks. In other words, in your fellowship, the reason that you have peace and you're ready to share is that, you're, that you are not supposed to be bitter and overcome with roots of bitterness because you're supposed to have cultivated a heart of thanksgiving. Enter by his gates with bitterness. Is that what it says? <laughs> Enter by his gates with jealousy and strife. Enter by his gates with thanksgiving. Why with thanksgiving? Because of Christ. How not to enter with thanksgiving after the songs that we have sung here this morning. After seeing how mightily God has worked for us to reconcile us with the Father and has given us a ministry of reconciliation. How can I not come through His gates with thanksgiving? How can I be the preamble to everything that's going to happen in fellowship? How can I be the compelling guide and force in my life that I am thankful for what God has done? That settles me at peace. It is well with my soul. Fellowship is a Christ thing. Fellowship can only arise in man's heart toward God and one another because of the reconciliation that God has wrought in Christ. That's the only way. Every time you forget your reconciliation with God through Christ, your heart is thrown into turmoil. Your heart is thrown into warfare. But the minute you're reminded what Jesus was quick, every time he appeared in his resurrection, he said to his disciples, what? Peace. <laughs> peace. It's not the peace that other religions talk about, a vain peace, an empty peace of men based only on our works. After all, our reconciliation and our fellowship is divine, has come from above it is not of men it is made in heaven it is heaven that has come into this world to reconcile us unto him and not just to reconcile us unto him but to reconcile us one to another to to, to the bible says to bring down the wall of hostility to bring down the wall of hostility oh as you meditate and dwell on Christ. And as Ephesians here says, given thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to see that your reconciliation with Christ becomes the basis for your reconciliation with one another. And I'm going to come back next Sunday to finish this message, but I just want to highlight the next two items before we break for to prepare for the Lord's Supper. Folks, you read then in verses 19 and 20, a lot of talk here about singing. Sing, make music, sing psalms, sing songs. All kinds of expressions, musical expressions. And it says in praise. In other words, when you, when you look at what some of these words have in common, it's the idea of praising God. Praising God. Our fellowship is a thing of praise. 
our fellowship. We have we come together as those who have a praise in their hearts. I ask you, is there a praise in your heart this morning? <laughs> I remember Paul and Silas in the most inner cell, and they got their praise on because they had a praise in their hearts, regardless of the circumstances. If you don't have a praise in your heart, it's going to be hard for you to be in fellowship. You've been overcome with bitterness. You've been overcome with just the negativity of this world. If you don't have a real praise to God in Jesus Christ, you may be just filled with empty optimism and positivism of this world. And that is just nothing but self-centeredness disguised in Christianity. But when you truly, when you can truly sing of the redemption that has flown from Emmanuel's veins, <laughs> man, you're going to sing from the heart. You're going to get your praise on. There's going to be a song in your heart. Because I tell you, what is better than to talk about God? To sing about God. And what is better, better than to sing about God? To sing with one another about God. <laughs> What is better than to have a praise of my own? To share that praise with others. Notice, what you truly praise and value and, and you truly cherish and delight in, what is the only thing that can top your enjoyment in that thing? Sharing it with others. Sharing it with others. So that is why God created Adam and Eve, not just Adam. <laughs> That is why it's not good for men to be alone. Because God is too big just to be enjoyed by one. It's going to be enjoyed by the fellowship of the saints. The praise is going to be manifested. The songs are going to be exuberant. He has given us a new song. And we will be enjoying that forever and ever with him. And now we have an anticipation of things to come. Let us bow our heads and finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that there's somebody here that still is not in fellowship because his heart has not been reconciled with you. I pray, Lord, that today you may help that soul to run to you and believe on the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice for the sins of the world. I pray, oh God, that today may be a day of reconciliation, that they may experience that peace that surpasses understanding and that reconciliation that gives a peace not of the world, but the peace of Christ. Father, I pray that those of us that are part of your church already, having been reconciled through faith, that we, Father, may reflect on what fellowship is about. Father, help us examine our hearts. Help us be honest with you. Help us be filled with thanksgiving. Help us, Father, dwell on the great redemption that is ours in Christ so that we may come and do fellowship and get our praise on and be filled with gladness and joy and share it with others in the unity of the Spirit. For we ask you humbly, and we give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And the saints said, amen and amen. I'm going to ask you to stay put, those of you um, that came uh, prepared for the Lord's Supper. I'm going to ask you then to stay